episode uh, and bringing this to everybody because you know who we interviewed. It was Joe Alves. Joe Alves is the designer of the shark in Jaws. And uh, you know I'm a huge fan of Jaws, man. Like, yeah, you know man. that straight up. So, yeah, I mean. For sure, man. I mean, like, I, you definitely weren't letting me go into this without watching the movie. So, like, I know exactly no. how big of a fan you are of yep. Jaws. Uh, I can actually see a silhouette of the shark all the way in the back. Uh, yep. I'm sure that's a more detailed picture if you were closer to it and it was daylight, but... That shark is actually a uh, signed copy of the design of Jaws that Joe Alves actually signed. You know how so, I knew that? Because I told you. <laughs> and you told Joe. <laughs> and I told Joe. <laughs> so, Dude, so I, I am excited. I mean, this guy has brought us so much stuff. I mean, he was, uh, uh, he was production designer on Close Encounters. He's worked on... Um, I mean, Escape from New York. He's worked on Forbidden Planet in the 1950s. He worked for Disney. He worked with Hitchcock. I mean, this guy has got so much under his belt. He talks to us about all of it. So, yeah, dude, I just... Escape, Escape from New York, man. That was like, that was the thing that got me like amped for this interview, man. Like, that's, uh, man, Snake Plissken, man. That that was like, oh, he, yeah. was, he was Han Solo, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and freaking like Nick Fury and, and, those types of characters all like rolled into like one and oh my god that's perfect what, what a what a what a dope role for kurt russell and what a great movie um and uh i didn't know that he worked on that and to find out that he oh, was yeah. a production designer on that as well was uh that was dope so yeah and you guys are gonna get to hear some awesome behind the scenes stuff on all these movies including jaws which i was like super excited to hear about so i don't even want to waste any more time i just want you guys to hear our first episode we're happy to bring you joe alves so enjoy the episode what's your name say it it doesn't matter what your name is say my name what's your name what what is your name tony you're listening to Don't Call Us Anthony Podcast. All guest views and opinions are their own, but don't worry, the hosts will share theirs so you can call them opinionated. But just don't call them Anthony. And now, the hosts of Don't Call Us Anthony, Cooley and Tony. I appreciate you coming on the uh, Don't Call Us Anthony Podcast. Uh, it's an honor to have you on. You have uh, an in crazy, a crazy resume of experience. Um, you were, um, you're, you're very well known for the first three films of the Jaws franchise, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, and just a massive amount of others. Your design on Jaws is the reason why I don't go in the water, um, and I can swim. So. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's a good reason not to go the water. <laughs> right. And then I saw that as a kid, and ever since then, I was like, hey, I think I'm all set. So uh, definitely, definitely worked for me. But um, I, you know, I just love to give you some time to, if you don't mind, just telling us how your your career as a production designer started, because you've been doing, you've done pretty much everything. I've I've kind of looked into your career. I mean, you've worked on. Um, in 1956, I think it was Forbidden Planet, right? And, right. And, and that's uh, that was amazing. So just to, to know that you worked on that film was great. So, okay. Uh, so we started oh, 1955. <laughs> We're going back a few years, aren't we? Yeah. Right. <laughs> mm, that was a unbelievable lucky thing. Uh, I was in art school, and um, I was I was pretty young when I. Uh, graduated from high school, I just turned 17 a day. And then I was in, uh, went to uh, college for a year. Then I went down to LA to see if I could get into films, you know? And uh, so I, I I was at the Chenard's Art Institute and uh, it was summer came and I didn't want to come back to the Bay Area because that's where I live. But I came up to see a, a fraternity brother. I went to San Jose State and it was so weird. He said, oh, uh, I said, yeah, I'm looking for a job. So oh, my wife's father works at uh, Walt Disney. Maybe you could see about getting a job there. So I thought, oh, maybe I could get a job in the summer sweeping up or something. Well, it just happened he was the guy that did the hiring for the artists. I mean, how <laughs> was that? And uh, he said, you know, you're, uh, 
you're too late for, he, he said, bring your portfolio. I said, well, I don't know if I'm ready yet. You know, it's only my second year. I just, just turned 19. And uh, he said, well, I'll bring your portfolio. Let me look at it. So uh, he looked at it and he said, well, you know, you're too late for the training program where they teach you how to draw Mickey Mouse and stuff. <laughs> I could put you into special effects. You know, you draw fire and water and stuff. I said, okay. So the next day, I, you know, they say, go to this room. I, there's a woman in there, Marion. And I said, what do I do? She said, well, you said it's this board. And there had a big light on it and three mm. little things you put the paper on. <laughs> right. And I literally didn't. I said, what do I do? She said, you flip the page and draw in between. Oh, okay. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we, I started, you know, working with her for just a few weeks. And then uh, Josh Better, who is an incredible animator, did uh, the fire and Bambi and just so oh, many wow. great, great effects. <clears throat> he was a really leading effects guy. And uh, Josh Better and uh, Dwight Carlisle was an older guy that w assisted him. And then Marion was working with them. And, and the process goes like this. You work as a trainee, then you become an in-betweener for a couple of years. And if, then you become a breakdown artist for a couple of years. Then after maybe five, six years, you become an assistant animator and it goes on. And just and at Disney, it just takes years and people were there for years. And so anyway, just I'll go through this quickly. She, uh, after a, a few weeks, she says, Joe, I've got to leave. I've got something to do. Just work with Dwight. So MGM got had this movie uh, and they were doing, they wanted us to animate the, the id and Josh was animating the id and different on this, it wasn't ink and paint. You had to sketch everything, you mm -hmm. know, with pencil and two different layers. And anyway, so I started working with Dwight. And so now I'm working as a breakdown artist uh, almost immediately. <laughs> and after a few months, Dwight has to go to the hospital. He says, so you start working with, you know, and I'm, I'm working now with the head, you know, animator for the id, and I'm just 19 and I'm assisting uh, Josh Menner, you know, and uh, so I draw the id for, and it was weird because it was big paper, uh, cinemascope paper, so it wasn't the normal, it was wide. Mm -hmm. So it was it was crazy. Uh, so within a few months, I'm I'm an assistant animator at Disney. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and then I'm working on uh, Sleeping Beauty. You know, <laughs> it's like one of the most iconic like Disney films. I mean, it's at the beginning. That's amazing. I mean, I'm working on at Disney. Uh, I'm working on Sleeping Beauty, and uh, the, one of the little fairies is ho holding a cookie. Hmm. And uh, this guy reaches over and says, no, the cookie should look like this. And I said, oh, thanks, Walt. And it was Walt Disney literally <laughs> correcting my drawing. So that's how my career started, guys. <laughs> that's insane. Now, was that your only interaction with Walt Disney, just that one time? <laughs> no, no. Walt was an extremely friendly guy. If you'd walk down the hall, you could talk to him. A couple of times, uh, the, the animator I was working for, he said, "Send this. Uh, take this up to the to the director. So see if this is good for him. You know, it was a, some some kind of finished drawing." And uh, Walt would be there, and he said, "Let me look at that." No, so I yeah, I had a, a few uh, conversations with him, and uh, it was an interesting guy. Uh, he was extremely friendly, but he was sort of anti-union. He wanted to sort of control, you know, the guys and. And I found after a couple of years, it wasn't a place I really wanted to work. It was, it was there was just a lot of control. Guys were there for, forever, for years, and they were satisfied. Uh, I guess I was young and ambitious, and I wanted to really work on live action. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, that was uh, a change that I made. Mm -hmm. And you were, uh, you said you were 19 when you were working for Disney? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, turned 19, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And you, um, I, I was looking kind of through your resume too. You did some work with, uh, with Hitchcock too, which is like another amazing uh, director. 
That was uh, very fortunate. Uh, there, there's another step uh, of how you go about it. Uh, when uh, I left Disney, I worked at a little theater, the Hollywood Playhouse, and I did uh, I designed the sets and I did the illustrations and the working drawings, the architectural drawings. So in live action, in the art department, you start, you're either a, a set designer, which is basically a draftsman, architectural draftsman, or an illustrator, and you, you draw, you know, illustrations. Uh, and that's pretty much how the unions depict them. So I started off uh, as a, a set designer, and uh, I, you start off as a junior, and you get knocked out. You're the last to be hired and the first to be fired. And I went, you know, to my gosh, I worked on Mutiny on the Bounty, the one with that, uh, Paul uh, Marlon Brando. Oh my uh, God! <laughs> I was just, you know, you're up in a, in a room just drawing pieces of a boat and stuff like that. And then uh, I, I went went to to Fox and Warner Brothers, and uh, you know, it was. I worked on, uh, it was interesting, uh, on My Fair Lady and um, <laughs> doing little things and walking around and you know, Audrey Hepburn would be walking around. Oh my God, she's so pretty. Oh my God. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So that was really a, a great experience. So uh, until you found a home, uh, which I became a senior set designer and at Universal, and I worked on uh, Mad, Mad, Mad World for ever, it seemed like. That was a big picture at the time. Uh, so, and uh, anyway, th then eventually I became an assistant art director. That's another union. Uh, and as an assistant art director, um, I worked with Frank Arrigo. He was great. And uh, he, we started working on this picture, Torn Curtain, with Alfred Hitchcock. And uh, Hitchcock, I, I learned, uh, learned a lot about it from Hitchcock. Uh, in other words, I've worked on so many movies where you design all these sets and the director, you barely see them. You know, mm -hmm. with Hitchcock, he knew what he wanted. He, he was an art director, you know, before he was a director in England. And uh, for an example, Peggy, his assistant, called me and said, Mr. Hitchcock wants to see you. You know, you didn't call him Hitch. Only a few people called him Hitch. <laughs> Mr. Hitchcock. Um, and uh, Hein Heckroff was the production designer. He was a, a German guy that was doing the ballet sequence, basically. But Frank was really the, the art director I worked with. And he, he taught me really how to design as a director because he had directed a lot of television uh, before he he decided to just design. Anyway, so I went up to see Peggy and she said, Mr. Hitchcock wants to talk to you. And so uh, Hitch uh, had a piece of paper and he started to draw and it looked like a worm crawling over a paper because he never lifted the pencil, you know. <laughs> and he, he said to me, okay, uh, Joe, he says, uh, Mr. Newman, Paul Newman runs across here and goes down these stairs. So you build the stairs and out went lock is going to do a, a painted backing of that. So you just build the stairs. Okay. Then down here, he comes out of the stairway, walks over to the registration desk and leaves. So you build that. I said, okay, but what about the reverse shot or what mm. about, no, no, no. You just build what I tell you. And that's the way he worked. In other words, he had storyboards, love storyboards. He visually understood what he wanted. Where so so many directors don't think about it until they get into the room they're going to shoot, and then they they sh they go to a window and maybe that's it. And you don't see the rest of the room. Mm -hmm. So it was he he uh, very interesting guy. Uh, we would meet every morning, uh, production manager, directors, and have coffee, and he would tell very unfunny jokes and uh, <laughs> you know right right <laughs> it would just be hitchcock and that was it so th that was an incredible experience for me uh being uh, a uh, an assistant art director and uh that was uh, that was a very fortunate 
And then I, I became an art director and uh, my biggest break probably as an art director was doing night gallery. Oh yeah, yep. And yep. night gallery, I did that for three years. <clears throat> I met John Batten was a director, Jano Schwar. I worked with later uh, Jaws 2, uh, a young guy by the name of Spielberg. I did his, one of his <laughs> first shows. And, and so it was, uh, that, that show really helped me a lot in the designing because we would do, oh, 20 different sets a week, you know, because wow. we'd do really, in a, an hour episode, we could do two or three shows, which required totally different kind of looks, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was interesting. Uh, so anyway, that was sort of the beginning, you know. For sure, for sure. And I, I want to back up because you did mention um, a film you worked on, um, Mad Mad World. Now you, from what I've read, you designed the garage that Jonathan Winters like destroyed. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I did is, uh, yes, it, it was a garage. But we, as set designers, were also model makers. We you know, physically make three-quarter inch models. So I, I made the whole gas station at a water tank. And I had walls that would collapse. So I had little strings underneath that you pull. And you pull this string, and this wall would collapse, and that one would collapse. And then you pull this in the whole water tower. So uh, Stanley Kramer was the director. And uh, I took it up to Stanley's office. There was a young director, I forget his name now. He's very, oh, he's got really excited about it. He was playing with it. Anyway, <laughs> so they shipped it to Stanley's uh, uh, hotel room uh, he, in uh, Palm Springs, where they were going <clears> to <throat> shoot that, the, the, those sequences. And uh, <laughs> The, the lady or who, whoever it was that was cleaning the room thought it was a toy left behind and they threw it away. Oh my God. <laughs> I was very upset about that. I just, oh man. Just, what is this toy doing in Stanley Kramer's room? Oh. Get rid of it, get rid of it. So, how did that go over? <laughs> how was that even explained? Like the, you know, the dog eat your homework, you know? I wasn't there, but, but anyway. I worked on that uh, picture, uh, oh, for a long time, designing mm. sets. And as I say, I was a set designer. I wasn't an art director at that point, but it was a great experience. That would be probably in the early, early 60s, 61 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And now you, uh, you eventually obviously worked with Spielberg, but was your first, uh, I think with Spielberg, was it he was working on in TV and, and that's how you make, because I know you worked with him on the Sugarland Express that was before Jaws, so I'm not sure how that all connected. First thing I worked with Stephen on uh, was Night Gallery. Oh, Night Gallery, okay, yeah. He did, uh, yeah, he did one before uh, uh, the uh, premiere of it, and then he did an episode of it. And then uh, he we did a, a show called The Psychiatrist, and mm -hmm. we did two episodes of that. There were 16 episodes, six ep episodes, and then they canceled the film. So that, that's where I really got to know Stephen, uh, was on The Psychiatrist. And uh, then we did uh, Sugar Land, and uh, that's how we, we became friends with uh, Sugar Land. Okay. But that's not how I got Jaws, you know. Right. Do you want to tell us how you got Jaws? <laughs> I'm sure there's a story behind that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Stephen and I, uh, we spent a lot of time in Sugarland Express, uh, driving around Texas, looking for locations. Um, David Brown and Richard Zanuck were the producers. Uh, Dick Zanuck was pretty much the LA guy. Uh, and David Brown was the uh, New York. Uh, he, he dealt more with the, the scripts, finding the scripts, finding, you know, that, that kind of material. So I, I, after Sugarland, I was back doing, uh, a tell, they were doing these 90 minute movies, television movies, you know? And so, you know, I'm, I'm a contract uh, guy now. I mean, you, you work more, but you get paid pretty much just a little bit of scale and more. Right. Anyway, uh, I get a call from David Brown, which was sort of surprising because 
in those days in in the uh, studio system, you worked at a studio and you worked for the head of the department. In other words, he gave you the assignments. Alex Galitzin was a head art director and he would assign you these various shows. So what happened was I get a call directly from this big producer, you know, they did uh, uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and The Sting and all that. David Brown's wife, Helen Gurley Brown, was one of the editors of Cosmopolitan magazine. And she read this galley sheet uh, from a young writer, Peter Benchley. And uh, it was about a shark. It was called, you know, Jaws. And so he read it and he says, Joey, he says, uh, I uh, we got this script or this galley sheet. He says, I'd like to send it to you. And, and if you could draw pictures of, or, of the shark, uh, shark activity based on the, you know, the galley sheets, he says, I think I could sell this to the studio, you know, uh, because I need something visual to sell them this idea of doing a shark movie. Right. So uh, I said, okay, well, he didn't have a charge number, so he couldn't pay me. I mean, he, <laughs> you know, in other words, right. they they weren't active there to do it. Uh, so I, I went to the head of uh, the, my department and uh, he said, well, Joe, Zanuck and Brown, they're just do it on your own time. I mean, you know, in between what you're doing the television show. And I was doing a show that had a, a pretty much a lot of uh, locations, you know, big uh, mansions were shooting in and so you go check it out in the morning and see if everything's okay then you you go back to your office and do whatever so then i started drawing sharks now basically there's two things that are wrong is that i didn't have a charge I have number two as a set art director i could i should do only an occasional drawing if you're going to do a lot you have to use an illustrator mm -hmm. well, i couldn't use an illustrator because they didn't have money to pay an illustrator or charged to, they didn't have a charge number basically. So I did about two dozen drawings. You've seen those are the, the charcoal ones, the sketch, mm -hmm. the shark with the, the kid in the mouth and all that. And uh, Stephen wasn't on the, the film at that time. I'd go over and tell him what I was doing and so I think this might be interesting. He said, oh yeah, sounds like it. He said, I'd like to do a pirate movie though. He was interested in doing that. <laughs> anyway, Zanuck uh, and Brown did interview. They they had a guy that they, they thought was going to direct it. Can't remember his name, but he kept calling the the shark a whale and whatever. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but I w we had uh, a meeting. Mar Marshall Green's office basically uh, was the head of production in Black Tower on the top there. He. And uh, so we had a meeting with, with all the department heads, head of camera, head of editing, head of effects in Marshall's office. And uh, I had all my storyboards. And just a week or so short of that, they brought in Spielberg to direct it. And so basically uh, uh, what I did was uh, show them the shark does this, the shark does that. And and when Stephen knew he was going to direct, I think it was a couple of weeks before, we said, he said, uh, we both agreed, you know, we don't want to do this in a tank. There's some terrible movies that were done water and there's just a tank with a back painted background. Said, you know, we should do this in the real ocean with a full size shark or maybe bigger than a, you know, because I, what I researched was the biggest they ever found was like a 20, 21 inch foot. And so I had designed this. Uh, I talked to some an ethiologist that I worked with later uh, on it. He said, the perfect shark is like 12 feet. As they get, you know, like 16 feet is big, they get fat. So I showed that to Stephen and we figured, okay, we'll take the 12 foot truck and double it and make it 25 foot truck. Basically, so in that meeting, Morris listened, everybody listened to what I had to say. Then he turned to the effects department and said, well, can you do this? And they said, no, 
we can't build a shark we, in the real ocean. Nobody's ever done that. <laughs> and, and if we did, it would take a year and a half or a year, you know, to research. Besides, we're doing a, a, the Hindenburg, which is, much, you know, Hindenburg's going to be a big movie. <laughs> so was a little upset. Marshall lived on a boat, so he was a water guy, you know. Right. And he he put his foot his fist down on the desk and said, uh, "Jaws could be a bigger movie than the Hindenburg," and, and everybody in the room laughed. You know, <laughs> this shark movie is going to, you know, it, it was just a little dumb shark movie. If you mm. understand that, so as I was packing up, everybody left. And he called me over and he said, can you get the shark made? And uh, being young and ambitious, I said, yeah, I, I'll find somebody to make it. <laughs> and so he said, don't do it on this lot because everything was done in-house, you know. Okay, yeah. Uh, take it off the lot and, and just go do it kind of thing. <laughs> So basically, that's how that started. And I looked around and I found these effects guys, kind of did Godfather and stuff. And, and they, they said, yeah, it, I think it could be done, but I think it would take a good year, year and a half to, to test it and to develop all the materials for it because of, of the salt water and stuff like that. So then I found Bob Maddie, who was a retired guy, did uh, the um, giant. Uh, squid and 20,000 leagues under the sea and uh, oh wow so he worked at Disney's for years but he was sort of retired and he was very he was interesting uh I don't know if you have my book there's a a wire thing of uh, of a shark yeah okay uh no don't you have the the other book the black one I only have I have this is the first one I got the one that was first released oh, okay well, then the other one, I think, Bob said, give me a couple of days. He came back with this wire thing that you pull it and the mouth opens and close. Anyway, yeah, the other book is, is more complete. Okay. We did that one for the Catalina show uh, that uh, they had a Jaws thing for six months on the Catalina Island Museum. And then Dennis uh, Prince, the my writer at, at, uh, went to, got a, a distributor, and, I mean, a publisher, mm -hmm. so made the, the big buyer. You haven't seen that one? I've seen that one. I just haven't got a copy of it yet. So the uh, this was the first one that I got when it came yeah, out. Okay. Jim actually told me about it, so I grabbed it right away. Uh, it, uh, the, the other one is, is, is very, very complete. It has every illustration. Mm -hmm. In any case, that's, the point. Uh, so uh, we uh, we started uh, developing. I hired Bob, and we got Roy Abergas, uh, who worked on all the other three with me, because uh, he was a specialist in uh, in plastics and stuff and new things. And we found him. He was making breakaway bottles at the studio. He says, "Oh yeah, there's these new. We needed a." a a, a, a plastic or a, a fiber that would stretch but not break you know mm -hmm. anyway I, I got a team of seven guys and we basically we started putting it together i got an ecthiologist linda capanjo san francisco uh oceanographical studies and worked with him so i made a a four foot model and got it perfect and then we made it 24 feet, you know, uh, and uh, so we thought we would have plenty of time. That was uh, November, October, November, 73. The book came out 70, uh, February 74. And the studio said, we're going to start shooting this because the book was very successful. We've got okay. to start shooting this in two months. <laughs> and I said, wait, wait a minute, I need a year to build the shark. No, no, we've got to start shooting it. They totally didn't understand my problems. And then when the shark didn't work, they started blaming the shark didn't work. Mm -hmm. and, and I would tell, uh, we had three sharks, the left to right, right to left, and the one on a, a big 
Ukraine and and stuff. And uh, I'd go to Bob. I said, you know, what's working? I mean, he had the three they were working on. And he said, well, I think the left and right might be ready. So I'd go to Stephen. In the meantime, I, I, I was doing storyboards. And I ended up doing a couple hundred storyboards because they were too cheap to pay for an illustrator. <laughs> right. and Joe will do it. So I'm, and I took, I took, on location in Martha's Vineyard, I took a carpenter and a painter. That was it. I, I hired <laughs> local guys to build the boat. <laughs> right. you know, and, and that made the people that needed work on the island very happy. Hmm. It made some of the other people not so happy. That <laughs> right, this, right. You know, the playground <laughs> of Barbra Streisand and Walter Cronkite and all these people. And, and <laughs> they didn't need a shark movie being shot there uh but anyway uh so i'd go to bob uh, and he said i think maybe this one's working and i'd go to steven i said maybe the left to right one is working and he's i says if it if it works shoot it if it's uh if it doesn't it's just a trial you know we just a test and that, so that's basically how the movie went and the, the critics uh they had all sorts of you no, know, I used the barrels because the shark wasn't working. And the, no, I used the barrels like a Hitchcock thing. You know, mm. you see the barrels coming, you know that the shark's down there, you know. And if you look at all the storyboards, uh, every, every sketch I had of the shark, we got. We got every shot we wanted to. And, and we didn't want to over show the shark, right. like these shark movies now. We wanted to be suspenseful. And Stephen was very, very smart in doing that. You know, uh, it, it was, I had seen that the movie recently because they had a Jaws, not Jaws 3D, but Jaws in 3D in major films for mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. And uh, the 3D was okay, but, but basically I hadn't seen it on a big screen for years. And I was so far away from it that I wasn't concerned about this, whether this was working or that was working. I was just, I was so impressed with how good the actors were. Yeah. Uh, the three guys on the, I mean, it, it was perfect. Yeah. Shark and Dreyfus, and they didn't like each other, basically. That's know. what I've heard, yeah. The, the, well, he was just feud. Kid, <laughs> and we got this great English actor, you know. Right. So the positions were quite different. And Scheider was, well, he, he was just a serious actor. Mm -hmm. but, you know, Dreyfus was a bit, was a bit of a, you know, smart ass kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it was perfect for the character. Right. And, and, I, and I was just impressed how really good the movie was, you know. There were some shots of the shark that I wasn't too happy with. Uh, and I had to live with it because that's the way it was, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a shot uh, of the shark coming into the uh, uh, into the boat, in, into the cabin. And right. one of the last shots, uh, and it was not into the cabin, because we made two boats, you know, one that would sink and one would come back up. Right. And, uh, and then we had the regular orca. But then, we, you know, I, I made a sketch and I was telling Steve, if we can get the shark in the boat, that would be some terrific he said yeah so anyway uh, i we had some breakaway glass that's sort of hard to find and i had three panels of breakaway glass for three shots and it was everybody was tired they want to go home <laughs> so the first shot <laughs> and steven didn't like it and it goes away and uh and that's so that's i've got two left right okay <laughs> All right and so the next shot, it, 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 it comes in and it, it, Stephen wasn't too happy. And he said, cut, and I, over, I said, Stephen, I only have one more left. So maybe you could get a really a good departure of the shark and we could use that. And then hopefully we could get a, a nice clean break. So he said, good, good, Joe, okay. And we had that kind of relationship, you know, where we could talk about things. I, you know, I'd pull him over to the side, you know, because he was the director. I didn't want to tell him. But I also did all the storyboards. So right. that was 
story was. So anyway, he said, good, good. So I told Bob my, Manny, I said, Bob, this is it. We got one shot. He said, I'll get it, I'll get it. And so, boom, it breaks in perfectly, you know. And, uh, so that was pretty much the last that Stephen shot. Then he asked me to direct a scene with the little kid, with the shark grabbing the kid, which was just a dummy on a on a raft. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that was the first thing I ever directed. But uh, anyway, uh, so the, that, <laughs> that was Jaws, you know. The, you mentioned something too, because uh, that brings up an, a question. So the scene where uh, Kintner actually gets eaten, there's a, a black and white photo that I've I've seen for years. It's terrifying of where it's almost like the, the shark's like full head is sticking out of the water about to, and I, apparently like that was never used. You kind of just see like the, I mean, because it was too much, I guess at first yeah. or. Yeah, uh, what's the name of <clears throat> Java uh, still of that? that uh, what's, uh, she wrote the a book on Jaws from the island. She just passed away. Uh, Edith Blake. Edith, yeah. yeah. And, and, and what it was is it, it was a shot of, you know, and basically what happened is we, we shot in a little cove and it was all foggy and I had to line up the shark and the boat and everything. Uh, and, and it was really hard to see. But anyway, I, I got it and I wanted to get the sun right behind that shot. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it would you wouldn't see the shark so much, and uh, one of the effects guys, when I was ready to shoot, he jumps in the water. I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Oh, the the dummy's getting loose." I said, "Just leave it. I want to get." No, he kept screwing with it, so I didn't. I lost that direct. So anyway, basically, the shot that we wanted was just at breaking, and what Edith did, she shot a side angle of the shark like that oh okay and we never used this, that because that we didn't want to show the shark so much at that at that point you know okay, that mean? makes sense okay that, because the big one was you know we got to build a bigger boat yeah right when shider comes up you know yeah so yeah steven was uh we were in total agreement because we sat down and i roughed out this storyboards with him and then uh, i would leave the boat and go to my office on the, on the vineyard and and draw them and ink them and stuff like that mm -hmm. so uh, then we would put them copies of them on the in the production office on the wall and we would go and say the left to right shark is working we're doing those shots today so we were shooting towards the end storyboards you know these three storyboards that day with that shark, because uh, if we were doing a shark uh, with a shark being towed or barrels being towed or anything, uh, if it was just towed, it was fine. But if we had that, it had to go down, we had to put a, a weight down. Right. So the day's prep, whatever shot shark we were using, we couldn't just go do it. We needed to prepare for it. And, but, you know, Bob had to get the rigging and everything. So um, that, that's pretty much how it went. Yeah. And I, I mean, that movie is still, uh, it's in my top, top three movies of all time. Uh, it's just unbelievable. I don't think there has been a shark movie that has really touched it since. Um, I think that, you know, they're trying to do a lot of things now with CGI. And I feel like it, it worked. I feel like it, it works to some degree, but I always feel like CGI is good if it enhances a practical effect. But I think like the practical effects are just so much better. Um, and I think this movie proved it. So CGI uh, it can be very helpful, but it also could be overused. Mm. You know, where we would have maybe one truck that flipped over or something, a car got hit. Now they could have 50, you know. Right, right. And uh, I, here's an example I've used it. John Wayne and, and, and the Calvary could ride up and they've got 25 guys and, and then over the, the mountain come uh, 50 or 60 Indians, you know, right, right. You have 50 or 60,000 Indians. <laughs> right, right. But it's interesting, mm -hmm. you say Jaws will be 50 years old in two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, after, after, you know, I met, met you on that thing, 
Jim Beller was the guy that said, oh, you should sell your storyboards and things like that. So he, he was the guy that started doing my Joel's movie.com uh, w- website. And I, I started selling my storyboards, illustrations and stuff. And uh, so that was this century. And the last, especially since the pandemic, I get so much, some of it's rip off because people want to send me stuff and sign it all and then they send it, sell it online. But what's, what's weird is in the, in the last couple of weeks, I got two letters, would you sign it from, two from Hungary, one from Poland, and yesterday one from China. Mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> just imagine I'm getting uh, with a picture of me with a, with a shark thing, would you sign it? And I'm thinking, the movie's almost 50 years old. I, <laughs> I guess this person from China. Yeah. You know, I mean, th- that's unbelievable. Yeah. That a movie that old would have that kind of interest, you know, and when I sign it, and of, of course I, I signed it, to, uh, but I've never gotten one from China before. But it's it, amazing. Isn't it? Uh, yeah, the fact that it still has, I mean, that much of an effect. I mean, anybody I know that has not seen it, um, and watches it to the, you know, even says like the movie still holds up, you know, it's still just such a great, I mean, there are some, some things like, oh, well, they, it looks a little different, you know, cause they, they're used to seeing like high, you know, high end, like Marvel, like movies now. So you go and watch Jaws, but I mean, to me, it's like, that's still, it still terrifies me. Uh, <laughs> so there's a simplicity about it when you compare it with movies today, right. action wise, uh, you had to wait for the action. There's a lot of waiting, you know, uh, and, uh, and then there's a barrel, you know, mm-hmm. and Quint says, I'm gonna get him in, boom. And then it can't go down. It can't go down with two barrels. You know, they're two, you know, boom, that goes down. And what, what's interesting is that with that kind of subtle effect, it has lasted so long, mm. you know, because since CGI, we the last 20 years, we're just bombarded with unbelievable mm. stuff. I mean, I look at some of these movies and it, it's just amazing, you know, the, the amount of dimension of stuff that's happening, that this simplistic idea of one shark and three guys out of the boat would last so long. Yeah. Right. Mm. Well, and I think I think it's a testament to the acting, like you said, you know. And uh, so, and cool, you're gonna say sorry. You're yeah, no, no problem. I I just feel like you know back then, um, movie studios, directors, uh, writers, um, you know, production designers, like you guys had to like rely more on building tension through storytelling and and acting and the delivery of. Sure. the lines and stuff like that like where nowadays like it and it's like you said like it there is there is there are benefits to cgi and and to you know using that for the effects that they do but there is a stark difference in like how you captivate an audience right it's like you you had to do it there it was there was more of a human element to the way you had to do it back in, you know, the, the, the 70s, 80s oh, uh, yeah. and stuff like that. And then, you know, now it's more, it, it is more like, you know, how do you, how do you get the attention of the ADHD crowd like myself, right? Like it just draws you in with like all the color and the, the explosions and the, yeah, it's incredible. But, and I'm not saying that it, it's, uh, it was more difficult. It, it's, it's quite difficult today. It's just so many layers of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you look at the credits at the end of some of these movies, they go on forever. <laughs> I was saying that with a friend of mine. The, we went to go see, I think it was Ant-Man. And I was like, there's hundreds of thousands of people working on these productions. It's like, how do you keep track of everything? It's unbelievable. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And after, you, after Jaws, you you moved on. You, you actually did a, a, you did work on a movie uh, called Embryo. Okay. With Rock, um, with Rock Hudson, yeah. I think everybody, I think everybody has that movie that when they're they're a kid, like the adults in the house, whether it's an older brother or you know mom and dad or whatever, somebody's watching something that they don't want you to watch, so they make you go somewhere 
<laughs> and then you you're like kind of like peeking through the door and you're like catching little parts of the movie. Embryo was that movie for me. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Uh, and when I finally got a chance to like actually watch it and and like watch the story all the way through, like it's actually like that movie's that movie's like really good. <laughs> yeah, and it was it, it's so funny because. In the garage, I have a, a workshop and I do a lot of sculptures. I've done so many sculptures, but there's a table and it's a stainless steel table. And that's where Rock Hudson did all his his stuff. And oh, no way. <laughs> after we, after we, you know, it, we did an independent thing and they just uh, cut the, you know, get rid of the set. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll keep the table. And so I go there and I think about it. Yeah, Rock Hudson, you know, and it was interesting, very, very nice guy. He was, you know, you work with some of these big celebrities and some of them were just really not too nice. Rock Hudson was a super nice guy. Uh, Paul Newman was a super nice guy. There, you know, then there's some people that were not so nice. I don't know if I want to go about that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Embryo was, uh, was in between, uh, what happened was, on Jaws, when Stephen was cutting Jaws in the winter, we went skiing. And uh, and we were, a good friend of mine, it was Dick Smothers, he had a condo up there. And we went skiing and we got snowed in and uh, we couldn't ski. And he started talking about, uh, and he was going to do a thing called Bingo Long and his traveling all stars about black baseball in the 30s. and. So I said, okay, we're gonna talk about being along. So I, I got a bunch of old life magazines of that period and stuff. So we're talking about being along. Then he started talking about this script that he was writing called Watch the Sky. And, and it was based a lot of it on Dr. Hynek's book, uh, UFO, A Scientific Inquiry. And he started talking about these UFOs and you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, boy, that sounds, a little bit more interesting than this black baseball, you know. Mm. He said, well, yeah, but I, I don't have a deal. So anyway, we went back home and I, I think Ralph Nelson or somebody, Bill Gilmore called me, uh, who was production manager on Jaws, later became a producer as Adam Cabrera. Anyway, he, he, anyway uh, Ralph Nelson hired me to do uh, the uh, embryo, and then I got a call from John Baden saying, oh, I got a movie called Bingo Long and his Traveling All Star. I said, I wonder if you want to do it. And I said, well, I guess Stephen's not doing it. You know, it, it's just funny how the community, these are people that I've met it on, on Escape from uh, uh, Night Gallery, you know, and so mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, so that's when I did that. And then uh, when that was finished, Stephen called me. He says, uh, I think I got a deal uh, with Columbia. Uh, could you go over there? And we need to find a, a mountain, you know? And so. Oh my God. I, know. I love this. <laughs> uh, I, I talked to John V, who was a head of production there. And they didn't have a production manager. They didn't have anybody. <laughs> Michael and Julie Phillips are going to be producers, but. <clears throat> John just said, look, Joe, just go off and find a mountain. <laughs> and we get to start. So uh, <clears throat> what was interesting is I, I had a big, Verna Fields, who won the Academy Award for Cutting Jaws. She was now vice president. She had an office and, uh, and then she had a spare room and we'd go hang out, Carl Gottlieb and I with different people. And I had <laughs> this map of scenic USA with all these, Various uh, Chimney Rock, uh, let's see, uh, Ship Rock, all these rocks. And then Carl said, Oh, yeah, and, and go look at this thing called Devil's Tower. I think that might be interesting. So, okay. So, anyway, <clears throat> I, I was by myself. I, I flew to uh, Monument Valley, uh, uh, South Dakota. And I thought maybe I'll shoot the, the backside of it or it might be interesting. So then I, I rented a car and I drove 3,000 miles going to all these different rocks. <laughs> and uh, and then I was in Gillette, Wyoming, and I'm driving along 
and then suddenly this little peak appears and then it disappears and I'm driving and then you're a little bit further and the peak is bigger and and as you get closer then suddenly oh my god this thing was just fantastic and in those days you, you took a sack of 35 millimeter film because you know and you did pan shots so I did pan shots of all these different rocks but I, I, I knew that that was the one Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so I got back and Stephen agreed, oh yeah, it's definitely Devil's Tower. Now, we, we, interesting, uh, a couple of years ago, the art directors gave me a, an, an award, a lifetime achievement thing, and I was talking at the, uh, the uh, dinner, there was about a thousand people, all the, the new art directors were there, and I said, so guys, I had to drive a thousand miles, three thousand miles to find you know, Devil's Tower. I said, but today you just Google it, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> so <laughs> true. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting finding that I was I, I I went to our Arches National Park and I said, Oh, this is great, but not for this movie. And a couple of years later when I did Geronimo, I said, God, I gotta go back to Arches because that so in the travel you see stuff that you weren't expecting to see, but it becomes knowledge right. you know, when you google you find stuff really quick and there's no question if i want to research if i'm drawing sharks i get on give me pictures of sharks and all these sharks appear so what's interesting uh, I, you know i am so clumsy with this that's why my daughter had to come <laughs> in it's all good but she's so on top of it um there is stuff that i can relate to that is so convenient but uh, then again, some of the old ways, you know, worked in, in many ways by accident, you, you, you know, so it was interesting. Find those Devil's Tower mm -hmm. was a long drive. Uh, and what was interesting about that is when we went to shoot it, I, I had a the, for we, for our offices and trailers and stuff for the actors, I had to build a fence near the Devil's Tower. And the ranchers were very upset with me because in Wyoming, we don't build fences. You know, I said, but this is not for you. This is, you know, okay. So there's a, a shot where Melinda Dillon and Dreyfus run up through the park mm -hmm. before they go up. So I put a sign because we, we had a thing uh, there's a bad thing happening in a pandemic. We've got to get everybody out. Remember, they got on train. I put a sign in the park, park closed. So we're going to shoot it. And the ranger stops me. He says, you can't close the park. I said, I'm not closing the park. It's just a movie sign and the park's closed. He said, I can't let you put that up. I, I said, but I'll take it down after I shoot the sign. He says, no. So they were a little reluctant to have us there. So I shot it without that sign. A couple of years later, I mean, from now, because uh, there's shots of me 40 years ago, whatever it was, you know, taking sh shots of that. Uh, the uh, uh, Wyoming uh, Committee for, what would what, 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 what I say, uh, tourist, tourist committee, mm -hmm. you know, they wanted to expose the idea that Devil's Tower was shot at close encounters and come and see. So they they flew me to Wyoming to go through the whole thing that I did mm -hmm. on Devil's Tower uh, and finding it. It was really a great group of people. Uh, so they, they did a film on go to Devil's Tower, go to Yellowstone, go to that. So, you know, 40 years later, they wanted to explore the <laughs> idea that that was the tower that used. But when we shot it, I couldn't put up the, the park closed. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Isn't that just the way, though? <laughs> well, it's it's like you're making a dumb, a dumb shark movie that 50 years later, people are, <laughs> you know, wanting to see it. You know. Yeah, you, you did say, you said something that, uh, I mean, I've had this conversation, I think I've had this conversation with you, Tony. Um, like, I, I feel like you, know, you you hit on something that made me feel like we are kindred spirits in a way because uh, nowadays the the internet 
I feel like the internet kind of has ruined the movie experiment experience, right? Like, uh, because for me, it's like back when I was growing up, you know, I'd get a magazine and like in the magazine, you might see a, uh, an ad for a movie or something. But the movie's coming out in like a month or so after that ads in, in the magazine. And you might see a couple of trailers, like a few weeks before the movie's coming out. Yeah. Right. But now I know about movies like seven years before they're coming out. I know, <laughs> so true. Yeah. I know that they're going to be made. They haven't even started filming yet. I just know they're going to make the movie. I know when they cast the people, I know who's going to be in it. I know what the movie's going to be about by the time it's coming out. I know, I pretty much know the plot <laughs> and, yeah. and it's just like, by the time I go to see the movie, it's just like, I'm already anticipating what the sequel is going to be. And you know what, you know, it's yeah. just to me it's just like i i long for the days where i don't know anything you know it's funny that you said that i think they're trying to get back to that though like with i hope netflix. so but with like netflix and stuff you know how like when netflix first came out you could binge all like eight episodes mm -hmm. now they they have they make you wait at least a week <laughs> until you can see the next episode <laughs> there's some anticipation at least so Which i is agree good. with you on that yeah. yeah it's just so much stuff on there i mean my wife and my daughter are just onto it and it's it, it just amazing i mean it, it, i was reading this book a very very interesting book uh called obituary mobituary <laughs> are you familiar with it no, I'm not, no. Uh, the guy he he's on jane polly quite often uh, and uh, but it, it it's it's about obituaries but it's about things that you don't know about that person like audrey hepburn did you know you know, she, during the World War II, she was living in Holland, it's going through the same thing that Anne Frank went through, she got down to 80 pounds and all. And so you're reading, you know, all, all this, this stuff. Wow. And uh, it, it, it just goes on like that. Anyway, I read this book, my wife's on her phone and I said, boy, my, my sister, my older sister would love this book. And she says, okay she hits her phone she's going to get it tuesday i said what <laughs> well, i used to have to go to the bookstore and buy the book and then go to the post office and she immediately did it all she bought it sent it and it was yeah so that's what you guys are living with you know it's if you know how to manipulate that stuff it's it's there right yeah mm. it's I mean, there yeah i mean mm -hmm. if it, it's it has its positives but i yeah I know, I know what you mean for sure. But I, I really like, like, like what you said to him, like the, like binging, like that, it blows my mind. Like, I mean, if you look at um, Game of Thrones, I don't know, Joe, did you watch Game of Thrones oh, when it was on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so like, we got into these characters, we got into like, you know, all these things, and like when they died, it meant something because you got to know the character and you oh, sure. anticipated what was happening from week to week. Yeah. And now if you just like decide you're going to watch Game of Thrones, like, from you know the whole first season in one sitting like within two days it's like <laughs> you don't get any of that like it's just like the person dies like the red wedding happens and you're just like man it was cool because <laughs> you didn't you don't care about the characters because you don't you don't marinate on any of it yeah well that's the thing what when you have to wait a week for the thing and and you let it digest right now, now they're just everything is there and mm -hmm. it's just boom 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 as much as you want yeah you get on netflix and you get a whole series at once you know yeah it's true it's, it's quite different i do want to touch on i i think it's important to definitely recognize you know you directed jaws 3d yes um, and i you know i know you were second unit director on jaws 2 which i loved as well um but jaws 3d was was you know you directed that film so i'd love for you to talk about that experience how that directing opportunity came along I would appreciate that. That would be awesome. Um, I was working on a picture called uh, Ninja. Uh, oh, for Ninja. Like, oh, my God. Yes. I didn't know that. I love that movie. Like seven months. Yeah. And uh, I was building sets. I flew to Japan, researched, oh, scouted Japan, came back. And that was for Fox Studios. And it, it, it was sold to another guy. And if they weren't shooting, he canceled all the films. So after <laughs> seven months, uh, so I come back uh, to LA and uh, I go see Verna 
and she's now like a vice president. And she says, you know, Joe, they, they've been doing this thing, Jaws, Jaws 3, People 0, or, you know, whatever. And it's about making fun of the people that made their most successful movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really pretty disgusting. Right. <laughs> yeah. So they were developing and they were going to, they were going to shoot it. And then something happened, whether Spielberg got involved, but it, it was, it was just terrible. You know, the I, I read it, the thing, and, uh, and there were some good people involved in it. It was, it was amazing. They weren't involved in Jaws, but they were going to make fun of Jaws. Okay. And uh, she said, uh, so Alan Landsberg, who was a television producer, did pretty much low budget television stuff, has bought the rights to Jaws 3D. Zanuck and Brown don't want to do another sequel. You know, uh, the, the only sequels were done much was the, the, the boxing thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so she said, go talk to Landsberg. And uh, so I went and talked to Lan Landsberg. He was okay, but he's a very controlled guy. And, he says, well, I, I, I said, I, you know, because I directed almost 85 days of second unit of Jaws 2. And mm -hmm. the reason is they fired the first director and I brought in Jeanneau Schwark from Night Gallery. And so uh -huh. we worked together. Anyway, I, so I, I really wanted to go into the, the directing thing. And um, so he said, well, look, at uh, go with the, the writer and... Uh, and go scout, it's, it's at these uh, uh, water parks, you know, and, uh, and, and see what you could come up with and we'll, we'll decide whether you direct it or what. So what was the, the director, I mean, the, the writer. And uh, so we went to various water parks and was one in Florida and, and they had, oh, as a side thing there, they had a theater, they were showing uh, underwater, 3D movies, and it was really interesting. You, we sat in there and you're going through the kelp and the rocks and stuff underwater and the dimension was incredible, you know? So, uh, came out and he said, what? Jaws in 3D? And I said, no, Jaws 3D. That takes the onus off of the third because you're just adding a D to the Jaws. Mm -hmm. you know, Jaws 3 D and uh, so I got back and I made uh, it was a, a Thanksgiving vacation thing. I made a uh, the, the, like the shark coming at you thing. <laughs> yeah, a picture of it, and then I had Jaws three D three D D. You know, so I, I I took it to the Landsberg and she's kind of let's let's go take this to Universal. So uh, I, I took it to Universal and. Uh, said Scheinberg was the president then, and he says, can I have this? I said, of course, you can have whatever you want. He took it to Lou Wasserman, and they said, okay, we're going to do Jaws in 3D, and Landsberg's going to produce it, and you're going to direct it. So that's how that happened. Well, little did I know that the 3D equipment was old and bad and didn't work, and we, but England to make a new camera, Aeroflex is going to make us, because uh, they used to use, you know, the House of Wax, two huge, you know, 3D cameras to make this. So we're trying to solidify that to do one camera. And so your, your film would be, half would be left and this would be right. So they would split the film. Do you understand that? Right, so, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I had a, a lot of problem with Landsberg. Uh, uh, so um, anyway, uh, that, that was a problem. He says, you got to start shooting, you know, at, at October 1st or whatever. I said, but we don't have camera. What we have, Jim Contner was, Contner was my cameraman. He was just great. He was a, an assisted cameraman on Jaws. And uh, so we shot the first week with this old stuff and it didn't work. We got the new camera and we had to reshoot the first week because it didn't court. Anyway, uh, I had a nice cast, Linda, uh, I, 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 I'm trying to think, John Putz and, uh, you know, 
it was just a nice group of people. Uh, and uh, it's just, Landsberg was on me all the time uh, to shoot this and shoot that and stuff. But, uh, and just getting the coordinates together, God would walk dailies and our eyes would be killing us because it, it's not only in the film is when you project it, uh, you got to do that, you know, coordinates. So uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was a killer. Uh, to make, uh, as I say, the cast was good. Uh, Dennis Quaid, you know, and uh, but uh, Landsberg, like the first day of shooting, I had Dennis scooter in a water scooter come in, jump on the on the wharf and walk, it. and he'd be there. No, no, I want you to shoot this. I said, well, wait a minute, I think I'm directing it. And he said, yeah. So I, I had Scotty Mayton was my assistant director and he was about six foot four, big guy. And I said, J just keep Alan away from me when, he, you know. So basically that was it. And, and then let me say this, um, I thought it was pretty good. So I, I cut it the same as Jaws one and two, we, it was uh, two hours and three minutes, exact same time. And I cut Jaws three, same time. They cut a good 20, 25 minutes out of it because I didn't have final cut. If you don't have final cut, once you, you say cut, you wrap, you don't have the movie. They'll, they'll cut it whatever they want. Yeah. And so they cut out a lot of personal stuff. Uh, and the reason they did is because they wanted to have five screenings instead of four screenings. And so if it was sh shorter, they could have five screens and they could make more money quicker. And uh, they even cut the, the distribution time because they had another 3D movie because I thought that was it. And they underestimated the popularity of Jaws 3D. It really did have quite a good audience, you know. So that that's the unhappy thing uh, that... Uh, the cut was not what I particularly wanted. And a lot of the critics comment, oh, I cut it too fast. I cut out a lot of you know, stuff. Mm. But when you don't have final cut, you, you don't have control, you know. There are reasons for cutting that out of the, on the streets. <laughs> like, we're going to make five more skin. You know, I mean, like, yeah, but you're killing, like, some of the heart of the film. Like, wh that's a horrible sacrifice to make. It's, why would they do that? It's Any chance awful. of a director's cut? Oh God, it's been so long. I, I I don't know. I think somewhere people ask me, I think I have some 35 millimeter film wrapped up, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. It's interesting, uh, but the movie doesn't go away. There's going to be something in, in July, I guess, in Florida, uh, some kind of Jaws 3 convention thing. I think they want me to come to. Well, that'll be awesome. Be awesome. Okay. I know that uh, I talked to Jim Bella recently and he said that he's, in the past, he said they found some of the scenes that were not in the film on YouTube, but he doesn't know if they still exist. But he said he's seen the, some of the stuff that was cut. So um, hopefully it's out there. If I, if I do some digging, I can find it, but I feel like it might be hard. So well, it, it's interesting because the, the directing thing, I had a, a number of projects uh, that I was going to direct. I, I you know, worked on, on one for like seven months uh and uh independent thing and it was uh, a a space thing a futuristic thing kind of thing and uh did a lot it was in utah and hired a lot of young artists to draw it and then the, the producer came and said the money just ran out and, and that was it mm -hmm. and then there was another movie called out in front was about formula one racing because i used to race cars i raced cars for about eight years and uh I That's got awesome. all over Europe and, and I came back and uh, Bill Gilmore was with me and we're going to produce this thing. And I had, uh, uh, let's see, I had a pretty good actor lined up for it, uh, Jim Brolin, because it was going to be older actor, uh, older driver, younger driver, Jim Brolin and Dennis Quaid and stuff. And then that company got sold out. So <laughs> anyway, I, and so I, and then finally my, my agent, my father died, he says, I gotta, you gotta meet two young filmmakers, uh, Deborah Hill and John Carpenter. And uh, so then I, I went and I made uh, Escape from New York, uh, which was probably 
one of the most fun movies. Awesome. That's <laughs> so good. Escape it's from so New York good. is like one of my favorite movies from my childhood. <laughs> Let me tell you about that because Deborah was a real go-getter. She wanted to be president of a studio. John was sort of a laid-back guy, maybe a little weed sometimes, you know. But very, very well. They had made, you know, uh, Halloween, and you know, oh man, yeah. It, they, they spent like three hundred thousand dollars. So that was so. Escape from New York was going to be their big budget movie, six million dollars, and uh, I had just come off of. Uh, uh well i guess close encounters at jaws too and we're talking about 20 25 million which is nothing today but that was a lot then mm -hmm. so we, we had an interesting relationship in that i think my success is is due to being aggressive we got to do something now we got how are we going to do this you know we're a lot of film people just lay back and say well i don't know it'll happen and I said, no, you, okay, John, well, we got anybody scouting? Yeah, Gary Bernard, is, well, has he scouted? We, we need a bridge that we're gonna, has a wall or we need a wall and make a bridge. And, you know, that's, a, that's the end scene of the, the movie. No, no one's done that. I said, okay, well, let's start looking, you know, call film people, film commissions and see if there's a bridge. Oh. Okay, so um, that was just my nature, you know, mm. and Deborah was with me. Yeah, well, and John was more laid back, you know, so went to St. Louis and I found a bridge. Uh, I said, it's a great bridge. I'll just build a wall, 200 feet wall. Oh my God, the whole uh, urban renewal was being developed. It just St. Louis was being torn down. I said, this is New York. <laughs> That's awesome. We've gone to New York. Uh, John and Larry Franco was assistant. And we got on top of the trade towers and we looked at New York and we said, ah, oh, this is, we can't do this. You know, it's, it's just too much. <laughs> so when I saw St. Louis had the bridge, had the town and, and uh, had in a great old state uh, uh, train station, I, I, I said, this is it. And I went back, I was very excited. And uh, Dean Cundy was a cameraman. God, he was great. I mean, I could tell you stories about that. Go on. But so John was like, oh, yeah, this works. This works. So, uh, and, and just so many things happen. Uh, we have to have an airplane wreck. Mm -hmm. So there's a place in Arizona, you go get airplane parts. And I'm going through and I, and, uh, I need uh, tail section, wing sections. And the guy says, oh, uh, I know where there's a, a DC-8 uh, that's for sale, uh, pretty cheap. Well, well, it's not a jet, but without the props. You, I said, yeah, where is it? In St. Louis. So they have a, this airplane in St. Louis. So I go there, we buy the airplane. We don't even tell uh, uh, the commission we're doing it. And <laughs> we chop it up, we bring it to the location, and we set it up. And, and John is so funny because I did sketches of it. And uh, so, okay, what are we shooting today, John? Well, we're shooting Joe's shot. We're talking, you know, what's his name? Uh, the actor of. Oh, Kurt Russell. Kurt, Kurt Russell, Russell, yeah. Walking by this burning uh, airplane. I mean, so we had the, these, these incredible shots for this really low budget movie. So we set it on fire and, and Robert Gass, you know, he's the guy that did Jaws. He, I said, okay, stop the fire. I started again. He says, I can. It's magnesium. It won't stop. <laughs> so, so I said, get back, Kurt. Right, do the same thing again. It, 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 uh, it just goes on. One last story about that. I built the it was United States Police Force in Los Angeles in an area where there was a dam, and I built all these buildings, sort of a shaped kind of building, United States Police Force. So we were so low budget, we took the entrance building where you come in to check in, was, we collapsed it, put it on a truck, drove it across the country. We took the last boat to Liberty Island so we didn't have to pay for a special boat and we set up the building. And so we had the actor, can't remember his name right now, and we have a big shot of 
Liberty, you know, Statue of Liberty, if you remember the shot, and he walks through and he checks the gate, the check in here. And Dean Cundy was incredible. He does this shot and then it goes to black. He cuts, measures everything. We collapse the boat, put it on a truck, come back, set it in LA. He puts a camera in the same place and continues the, the pan shot. No visual effects, just a perfect pan. We went from Statue of Liberty to LA in one, you know, that's awesome. I mean, th that was the way we did escape from New York. It was that is so cool. You know, yeah. it was it was fun. It was it was uh, one of the most fun movies to work on. I just really liked those people a lot. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and but, Kurt Russell. Kurt Big Russell is such an awesome actor too. So I mean, to work with Kurt, I mean, he's just like incredible. So Kurt was great, and of course Goldie. They've been together for years. Yeah, she's a, a sweetheart, man. Yeah. Just some really nice people. Yeah, Kurt was very, there was an interview about that. And he was, he just gave me a big compliment about, you know, my, my, the shots. That we did. <laughs> yeah, Snake That's Plissken awesome. is like one of those characters that just like forever, like ingrained in my head. Like such a, but, such a cool character. It, it was a very cool character and he had to watch and it was running yes. down. Yeah. <laughs> and then, oh, another thing, you know, what was his name with, with the big, uh, uh, big Cadillac, and, yes. uh, and yep. I remember said maybe you could put a chandelier in in the Cadillac. I said, oh, a chandelier inside. So I bought these uh, um, um, the uh, Claudia was was my decorator. We bought we bought these big chandeliers <laughs> and we put them on the Cadillac, and we had to buy a lot of them because <laughs> they oh would break. But yeah. is that a crazy looking thing? It was, it was just, so good. It was awesome. <laughs> but that's why people remember it. I mean, because it's so iconic. It's awesome. Yeah, it was, it, it, that, I look back at that. It was just, we did crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was hanging posters in Dean Country. <laughs> I was saying, what are you hanging posters for? You, you got British Academy Award. You won all that. I said, no, no. We're, we were, there was no attitude. Yeah. I mean, we ever, whoever did whatever we had to do to get the shot. Yeah. Uh, and, and that sometimes is lost now, you know? Yeah. I feel like I've, I've worked on, uh, I've went to school for acting for a while and I, I've worked on sets and I've worked on, uh, you know, in theater and stuff. And it's, yeah, sometimes it really, it's with the people that you work with that you always find a way to just make it come together, whatever you have to do. Just yeah. to get it done. And I, I, yeah, I completely agree. I respect that. It's the, but the people you work with, it was a huge part of it for sure. And then you work on other pictures like I did with Steven Seagal and it was difficult. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I've heard. I've heard that. So, <laughs> oh, you know, we're, we're shooting in Kentucky and there was a little thing. I bid a, build a ranch house there and, and uh, it would be seven to eight o'clock. We start shooting. And he would show up at 10, 30, 11. Oh. And I told the producers, I said, that's all green out there. But in Kentucky, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be yellow and red. It's not yeah. going to be the same, <laughs> you know? And yeah. uh, he didn't give a shit, you know? Oh, Jesus. Well, you confirmed it about, about Seagal for me. I've heard that from a lot of different people, so... Hey, um, Tony, I know you got one. I know you got one question that you want to ask, right? I, right? I have one question, yeah. But there is, I mean because you mentioned it joe mm -hmm. um you mentioned working on ninja that was the that was that was the one with shokasugi right shokasugi well the the ninja was that was uh, yes he, he wrote it right yeah no. yes yeah. um and then it, it never happened oh it never ended up coming out no it never oh. it, it, it maybe got maybe it got made after I left, and they and, and a new director came on. Irv, okay. Kirchner, Irv Kirchner was the director, the one that I was working on, and then they canceled it. So you're talking about years later they made it. Yeah, because they yeah, ended up yeah. making like Revenge of the Ninja, then they made right, uh, right. Okay. Ninja Two so and Ninja, Ninja Three. Was, yeah, Irv Kirchner was the one that, that I, I I was involved with and it was based on uh the writer oh. yeah and and then so that would be let's see 1979 okay 
so there was yeah, the one the one that I'm talking about it was actually released in I think it was released in eighty one or eighty two. So I think it was eighty two actually. Yeah. Yeah. So what they did is is after that ended up, he found some other company. I don't know what, what studio made it, but yeah. Okay. All right. That that was it. Yeah, that, that was that was sort of a sad thing because I had started building the sets and I kind of I, I scouted Japan and it was it was crazy. Uh, oh my god, it, you must have been having a ball, like trying to like like you know just doing like sketches and stuff like that. Because I mean the the scenery is like beautiful out there. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it was. Well, there was a few pictures that I worked on that didn't happen or it got delayed. Uh, you know, and then you know you went on to something else, and then somebody else picked it up years later. It, it's interesting how some projects could be ten years in development. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we get to nowadays we get to see all ten years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I, it, it was so interesting scouting Japan uh, because Irv went with the, the the assist director off scouting one second. He said, "I want you to scout uh, the uh, the south of of Japan," uh, and uh, oh, I went to some beautiful places. So I had uh, one person on the train and. Uh, so we stopped at some place, and he says, "I got to go get something." And I'm sitting there at the state, and I'm thinking, "You can't read anything. It's not like being in Europe. <laughs> I, so I, I, so where the hell am I? And nobody spoke English, you know? And, <laughs> <laughs> no, no Google Translate or anything yeah, like that. Exactly. That's so true. <laughs> we we're on a train. It's so funny, and I'm sitting there, and one of these little kids get, comes up and. The guy's talking Japanese. He says, "Oh, this is a guy that did Jaws." Oh, so I did a little sketch for him. Oh my! Pretty soon, I got the line of kids on the train <laughs> to do little <laughs> Jaws sketches for them. It, it was funny. It was uh, it was a great experience. But then I came back and uh, it was gone. And so when I come back, then you you start looking for another job. You know. It's, mm -hmm. Thing about Hollywood, people will say, "Oh, you're success, and you got that." No, you know, after Jaws, I'm looking for another job. After yeah. that, it's it's how long you could keep finding jobs. And after the directing scene sort of fell through a little bit, then I started doing uh, production design again, and and that went on. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. so it's yeah, <laughs> it, it's. It's nothing about all these awards and all that stuff. That's that's fine, but what's the next job? You know? Right, right, right. Uh, keeping the continuity. Well, I have I have one question uh, that I wanted to uh, kind of close everything out with. Is you know you have been uh, a legendary, iconic production designer. Uh, worked on so many amazing films that, that people you know have that have stood the test of time. With that being said, Joe, what are some of your favorite movies? <laughs> you know, people ask me that, and, and I, I have it hard to remember. Uh, I mean, uh, Bridge in the River Kwai. Uh, okay. Classic. Uh, yeah. Those kind of movies. Uh, not so much big effects movies, but there was. Uh, of course, I grew up with singing in the rain and uh, oh yeah yeah you know uh I, I there's a story I, I tell about how did i get interested in movies or you know what is when i was 14 with a girl down the street i went to see american in paris mm -hmm. in kelly and leslie caron dancing around and then i found out later that it was never made in paris and well, who made it well the production designer made it sir you know on the MGM lot. And I said, Oh, my God, that's what I want to do. You know, <laughs> so but uh, of recent movies. Oh, gosh, uh, it's hard. I've seen so many. There's nothing that are, are, are really, you know, grabs me. Uh, uh, let's see, this year, uh, not to what, what was your favorite movie this year? Oh, it was past. Uh, the, I think it was this past year was uh, Top Gun Maverick. Okay. I mean, that was that was just for me. I'm a huge Top Gun fan, and I, 
I really didn't know if they were going to be able to, you know, live up to the first movie, but just the way it was filmed with the IMAX cameras and yeah, like it was a lot of action, but it was, know, but it was great. I, I but it was, with you. It yeah. was one of the most fun movies to watch. Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, it, it was exciting. You know, it brought me back to the, the nostalgia of the first film and that, that, yes, that was it did. It's hard fact, to do. And Tom Cruise was great. I mean, he, he looked a little older, not too much older and not too, too young, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would say that was one of my, my favorite movies. Uh, Mm -hmm. Some movies were hard to watch, uh, like the war movie. Um, um, you know. Oh, uh, I oh my God, it's escaping me. It just won. Uh, it was in the Oscars. I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, uh, won the foreign award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was just there was a lot of killing and stuff. Yeah. And the one that won for best movie, uh, I had a everywhere, yes. everything, everything, everywhere, all at once. I was going to say that is my favorite movie of the yeah. That's interesting. That's my daughters really love that. And mm -hmm. they, they say it's an age thing because I try to watch it twice. And I, really, <laughs> I had a hard time with it, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I And I think it was, to tell you the truth, it was probably because I was, I was putting subtitles because I couldn't understand. And then they had their own subtitles. And I'm looking at so many <laughs> subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> and people said yeah it is a younger group that really loved that movie an older mm -hmm. not so much but I mean, it's a lot it's a lot i think it, i think it's because it dealt it deals with like the multiverse which is like kind of like in marvel's like thing right now so i feel like yeah. a lot of people are grasping that concept which is what this was I, doing i grew so. up reading comics and watching like you know terminator like i, I know all about like time travel is like right, right. kind of been in, in multiverse and like you know like string theory and all that so like that's yeah. all like stuff that i grew up with and and so like seeing this movie was just like it was just for me it was brilliantly written like it was just it was really the writing and the acting and how it was like such a heart it was really it had a lot of heart it had a lot of family heart it, it did i just got confused where she was where she was. <laughs> gotcha. you know, I, I had a movie that understood <laughs> I had a movie that I was going to direct. It, it was uh, like a, a future thing, and, and it goes off through the universe, and it's the same people in the same place. And it was so interesting in in that this guy is walking down the street in San Francisco, and he sees this Mercedes Goldwing with the gold wings up, mm -hmm. and he goes inside, and nobody's there, and the gold wing closed, and it turns into a rocket ship, and he's off into another planet, and then you know, and so you know, so so. It was the same people, but in the in a different planet, a certain, different time. So I, I was, I was sort of related to that a little bit, but I, I just got confused anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, but it, it certainly did well for forever. I was happy for you know. Yeah. So anyway. Well, Joe, listen, I just wanted to to really thank you for coming on, uh, taking the time to talk to us. This was awesome. Uh, it was an honor to have you on. This was just uh, amazing. I, I love your work. Um, it's it's definitely affected my life in a lot of different ways. Same here. Um, same here. <laughs> scared the hell out of me, interested me, big Close Encounters fan. I mean, obviously, all of that stuff is just amazing. So, um uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And um, if where can people find um, your book? Because I know this was the the Catalina one, but there's you well, said there's on another Amazon. one. Okay, okay. Amazon, okay. and also joealbsmovieart.com. They okay. can find my illustrations. Mm -hmm. uh, but go to Amazon and and you'll see the new book. It's 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 black cover. Okay. It just it's, it's more in depth. Uh, Dennis really did a job. We put everything in it that we have there. Okay. So, awesome. Yeah. Right. If anybody wants to buy that book, we're going to put the links in the video uh, or below this. So you guys make sure to check out those links so you can grab that book. So, okay, guys. Thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate it and hope to talk to you soon. My Thanks, pleasure. Joe. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. And we truly appreciate your support. If you are listening to this episode, please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and rate it to help us share these conversations with others who may enjoy it. If you're watching the show on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell so you can be notified as soon as we drop new and exciting content. Thank you so much again for joining and be sure to tell your friends, just make sure you don't call us Anthony.